Well, this is Radio TV Fauno Nut, and someone recently asked me to make a video on the subject of replacing multi section electrolytic capacitors in vintage electronic equipment. And I'm finally getting around to doing this now that I have my computer back to somewhat decent operating condition. Hope we don't have any more mishaps with that. But anyway, electrolytic capacitors, as far as being used in tube-based equipment, are generally used in the power supply to filter out the ripple. And when the capacitor goes bad, the result is usually a loud, annoying hum in the audio. And electrolytic capacitors are also used for cathode bypass applications on amplifying tubes and solid state stuff. Electrolytic capacitors are used in the power supply just like in tube stuff, but they can also be used for coupling stages together, bypass applications, etc. So, before we get into how to actually physically replace a multi-section capacitor, we need to look at a few things first. First off, when looking at a capacitor, there are a couple of different things you want to take note of. The first thing is the actual value of the capacitor, usually given in microfarads. And the next thing is the working voltage of the capacitor. Now the value of the capacitor may be noted in MF, MFD, UF, UFD, depending on the manufacturer of the capacitor, age of the capacitor, etc. All this means the same thing, microfarad. Over on our right hand column, you'll notice several common designations for voltage. We have V, VDC, WV, or WVDC, as in volts, DC volts, working volts, or working volts DC. Working voltage is the amount of voltage that the capacitor can safely handle under operating conditions. Now let's look at a capacitor here. This is a newer capacitor. Get my act together here. If you'll notice it says 22 UF 450 volts. That means this is a 22 microfarad capacitor with a rating of voltage rating of 450. Now let's say we wanted to let's say this capacitor was defective and we needed to replace it. What would we what would we buy to replace it? Well, we can we preferably want to stick with a 22 microfarad cap. Although depending on the application, if it was used in a filter capacitor application, we might go a little higher. Say if you had a 33 microfarad cap on hand, you could probably use it and get away with it, but whenever possible, I like to use the same value capacitor that was originally used in the equipment. Now, looking at our working voltage, notice it's 450 volts. We want our replacement capacitor to be, to have a working voltage at least 450, if not greater. You never, ever, ever want to use a replacement capacitor with a lower voltage rating. For example, it would not be a good idea to replace this with a capacitor rated at only 150 volts because the capacitor would not be able to stand the higher voltage and it would likely blow up in short order. And when designing a circuit or whatever, I like to use capacitors that are rated at least, say, 20% higher than the maximum amount of voltage that that I anticipate ever being applied to them. I notice in today's world, with a lot of this modern Chinese garbage, they'll use, for example, a 16-volt capacitor, and there might actually be 15 or 16 volts running on that particular line. Well, to me, that's, that's cutting it too close, and oftentimes those capacitors fail. And when I replace such capacitors, I always go with, say, a 25 or 50 volt capacitor. You'll look back 
just looking back here you'll see my replacement capacitor stash. I don't I don't like to have to stop and order capacitors whenever I need them so whenever I get a good deal on a variety I just order them so I can have stock on hand. Now and what I usually do is for example for my low voltage work I just order one value of capacitor to handle everything. Let's look here. This is a get the camera to focus. This is a 220 microfarad 63 volt capacitor, which means I can use this particular capacitor in any application requiring a 220 microfarad cap up to 63 volts. And also, the size of these modern capacitors is a lot smaller than what they used to be, so let's say a capacitor rated at 10 working volts from 1968 is probably actually going to be larger than what this 220 microfarad 63 volt cap is from 20 whatever, 16, whenever this was made. I don't know when it was actually made, but it's a modern capacitor which means I can just order one value and not have to order say 15 220 microfarad 15 volts or another 15 220 microfarad 25 volts or whatever I can just order this one voltage rating to cover everything up to a certain point and like up here this is my top section where all my higher voltage capacitors are this is a 33 microfarad 200 volt which I can use in applications that require a capacitor up to 200 volts, etc. So you get the idea. Now let me address another concern that some people have brought up over the years. Here's an old dud capacitor, dual section capacitor that was removed from a recent repair project. Now let's look at the value on here. 50 microfarad 150 working volts. Now I've had people in this situation when they're replacing something like this ask me, well, I need a 50 microfarad capacitor, but I can't find one. All I'm finding is 47 microfarad. Will that work? And the answer is yes, it will work 100%. The equipment that you're installing it in won't even know the difference. In fact, in today's world, you're going to be hard-pressed to find a something like this, say a 50 microfarad capacitor. For example, if your old capacitor is 50 microfarad, it's perfectly fine to replace it with a 47. If it's a 30 microfarad, you can replace it with a 33 microfarad. A 20 microfarad can be replaced with a 22 microfarad. A 200 microfarad can be replaced with a 220 microfarad, etc. When ordering new capacitors, there are two different basic styles. You have axial lead capacitors, which means you have the leads coming out, one lead on each end. And you have radial lead capacitors, which means both, both leads come out of the same end. Now, usually I just order the radial lead capacitors because they're cheaper and they're more common. However, there may be some applications where it may be easier to install if you use axle lead capacitors like this, but you know, you'll have to determine that on your own based on what equipment you're servicing. Both types are available. And when I order capacitors, I try to stick to a name brand such as Panasonic or Nichicon and I also try to stick with the high temperature variety which is 105 degrees Celsius and that way they can be used in a wide variety of applications where they may be under a lot of stress so you don't want to use knockoff low quality brands of capacitors because they often don't hold up well in fact in newer equipment a lot of the cap failures I find are from lower end cheap capacitors. Okay, we're about ready to look at some different styles of capacitors, but before we do that, I need to bring up something that I forgot to mention a little earlier. In fact, I probably should have mentioned this first. You want to take note that uh, 
electrolytic capacitors are polarity sensitive. That means they have a a negative and a positive terminal, R plus and minus. You don't want to wire one in backwards because if you do, the capacitor will likely be destroyed and you might damage other circuit components. So how do you know which is which is plus and minus or positive and negative? Well, on most modern capacitors, the negative terminal is indicated by an arrow with a negative symbol in it, as you can see on this axle lead capacitor, and it would indicate that this end is negative. And also on an axle lead capacitor, the end that's negative is usually the case of the capacitor. You can see it's silver there. And on the positive end, you can see the difference there. It actually goes inside the the lead actually goes inside of the capacitor. And on these other types of older capacitors there will be some type of indication on the case as to which lead is negative. Now in some cases, especially on older capacitors, the band will be indicated will indicate the positive terminal and I believe this is one here. As you can see, this is an old capacitor from the 70s. Hang on. Okay, that looks a little better. As you can see, this is a 500 microfarad, 15 volt, and the positive end is indicated by the plus sign, as you can see there. So yeah, you always want to pay close attention because some older capacitors have the positive terminal called out. Now, on most modern capacitors, such as all of these here, the negative terminal will be indicated, just like you see here. Show you a few examples. You get the idea. Now, let's look at some types of capacitors that you're likely to find in vintage equipment. Often, the electrolytic capacitors in vintage tube equipment actually have more than one capacitor in the same housing. You can have anywhere between two and four capacitors in a single housing, as is the case here, and I will go over some of those. Here's a 1960s era multi-section capacitor. This contains two sections and is designed for printed circuit board mounting. Here's another printed circuit board mounted capacitor, two section. Now here's an older two-section capacitor like what you'll find in a lot of 5-tube AC-DC radios and record players. We have two sections in the same capacitor casing and normally there'd be three multicolored long leads coming out of this but this was a dud that I cut the leads off up close to the capacitor body so I could solder the new parts onto it. If this was, if this still had the leads on it, let's see what we've got. The red lead would be 50 microfarad, 150 volt. The green would be 30 microfarad, 150 volt. And the black would be a common negative. Now on this type of PC board mount capacitor, you'll notice we have some symbols here. The square represents 50 microfarad, 150 volt. The triangle represents 50 microfarad, 150 volt. And if you look at the terminals, you'll see that terminal has a triangle, so that means 50 microfarad. This terminal has a square, so that's the other 50 microfarad. And this terminal is negative, as you can see there. Here's our other PC board capacitor right here. Now its terminal designation is letter. B is 80 microfarad 150 volt. C is 40 microfarad 150 volt which it's covered up by that label but we know what it is. And A is our common negative. And then there's A which is our common negative. There is C which is 40 microfarad and there is B which is 80 microfarad. And here are a couple of CAN capacitors. These type are usually the hardest to change. 
and they are generally mounted on top of the chassis of the piece of equipment. Okay, let's look at our values. 100 microfarad, 300 volts, half circle, 10 microfarad, 300 volts, square, 200 microfarad, 150 volts, triangle, 30 microfarad, 150 volt, no symbol, and it's assumed the can is, po is common negative. Now, in some cases, you'll find a common positive can, but it's rare, and in such a case, that will be noted on the can. Now, you notice those symbols? Let's look under the bottom here. And if you'll notice, cut into the phenolic, they actually have the symbols by each terminal that correspond to the value printed on the can. There's our square, and that corresponds to 10 microfarad, 300 volt. Here is our triangle, and that corresponds to 200 microfarad, 150 volt. This is no symbol at all, and that corresponds to uh, 30 microfarad, 150 volt. And this is our half circle here that's got a bunch of gunk in it, and that corresponds to 300 microfarad, 300 volt. In some cases, the symbols won't actually be cut through the phenolic. They'll just simply be etched on the phenolic, so you'll have to pay very close attention to make sure you're seeing them correctly. Now I need to discuss how we replace multi-section capacitor units with individual modern capacitors. These uh, multi-section capacitors are, for the most part, no longer made anymore, and the ones that are made are very expensive. So we just replace them with two or three or four, however many that's needed, individual section capacitors. This one here is 50 microfarad, 150 volt, 30 microfarad, 150 volt. So let's go into our capacitor stash and, and choose a couple of appropriate values. I've chosen a 47 microfarad, 200 volt to replace the original 50 microfarad at 150 volt, that extra working voltage rating will give us a little margin of safety there since in today's world line voltages can be a little bit higher than what they were 50 or 60 years ago the result of the today's higher line voltage might be higher B plus voltage on the capacitors so you it really doesn't hurt to have that little extra margin of safety and I've chosen a 33 microfarad 200 volt for the original 30 microfarad at 150 volt. And you can see that these two modern capacitors are much smaller than the original capacitor. Okay, in order to do this, I'll tie the, the two negative ends of our new capacitor together and solder it. Now, I'm not actually installing this in a set, but if I was, all of, these, all of these exposed leads would be insulated with either heat shrink tubing or spaghetti tubing. And we would solder these negatives together, cut off our excess, uh, slide heat shrink tubing up over the original capacitor leads like what we've cut off from here, and then solder everything together thoroughly, and then slide the heat shrink tubing over the leads to insulate everything and then that would take care of it. You want, when you install replace capacitors or any part for that matter, you want to make sure everything is securely insulated and, and securely mounted physically. You don't want any chance of something moving around or shorting out to anything. So the capacitor on the left is a 33 microfarad. That would connect to the green lead which was originally the 30 microfarad section of this. The 47 microfarad on the right would connect to the red lead since that corresponds to the original 50 microfarad section and the black lead would connect to your common ground here. And one other thing you can do to install a cap like this is unsolder the wires from where they solder to the chassis that you're servicing and then you can solder the new capacitors directly to the tube socket terminal or terminal strips or whatever. Just make sure you insulate them with tubing or heat shrink or whatever. Now it's not always feasible to do it that way, but that's an option. The easiest way is just to cut the leads and
splice your new capacitors onto it. And on these printed circuit board capacitors, the best thing to do is before you remove it from the board is make a little mark on it to where you'll know the correct orientation of the capacitor on the board and then carefully unsolder it from the circuit board with your solder sucker. Uh, try to use as little desoldering braid as possible because that just transfers the heat to the traces and that can cause them to lift. Sometimes you'll find a cap like this, a can capacitor that's mounted to a printed circuit board. When you remove it, take note of the four lugs on the can. Those often make up the ground circuit in the in the in the sur in the radio or record player or whatever. And when you take the capacitor out, there's no no ground path left anymore. So what you'll sometimes have to do is on the printed circuit board is take pieces of hookup wire and jump out each each uh, ground point on the on the circuit board where these little tabs originally connected. Don't assume that the four holes on the printed circuit board were the can mounts. That don't assume that they're connected to ground by any other means other than the capacitor can here. I remember one time I replaced a PC board mounted can electrolytic capacitor and a radio and not paying attention to what I was doing I just used, well, we'll just call it this, I just used this for my common capacitor ground and the radio wouldn't work. And I'm like, what's up with this? Well, these other three spots on the printed circuit board rely on the whole can of the capacitor as a ground jumper. So what I had to do was physically place a jumper wire between here, here, and here to make up what this metal can originally made up. That way all of these other paths that need a connection to ground now had a connect have a connection to ground. Before, by me just connecting our replacement capacitor here and leaving these two disconnected, or these three disconnected, we had no ground path for those other traces that needed to be connected through ground. And that brings us to these can type capacitors and usually they're the hardest to deal with because they are usually soldered to the chassis really well and there's often multiple leads connecting to a single terminal here and usually there will even be a resistor say connected between this terminal and this terminal with more leads connected to this terminal so it's usually quite a chore to get these out but it has to be done and while we're on that subject a word of warning Never take the lazy way out and just simply connect your replacement capacitor across the terminals of the old capacitor. That's a major no-no, even though that type of action was often recommended in some of the old-time radio and TV servicing books. You don't want to do that. If you have your new capacitor wired in parallel across the old one, the old one could become leaky or shorted and then that can cause major circuit damage so the best thing to do is just completely disconnect all of your positive connections from the old capacitor you can leave it on the chassis if you want to for appearance purposes and wire your new capacitors underneath but you don't want to you don't want your old capacitor to be left in circuit now I'll point out some helpful things that I use for mounting capacitors. And first thing are these terminal strips here. You can see I have various sizes of them. Uh, you can get these from Antique Electronics Supply or on eBay or various mail order electronics parts suppliers. I generally solder a terminal strip to the chassis and then that way I can disconnect the old can capacitor and if there's any resistors involved, which they will be, I can just wire them directly from say point A to point B. It's very helpful and it also gives the new capacitor a secure physical mounting. We don't want the capacitors flopping around. I want to keep some various sizes of heat shrink tubing on hand for uh, 
insulating your capacitor leads and terminals. Here are a couple of different sizes that I use. And we have some electrical tape here, even though I don't like to use it much because it just looks sloppy. If you use electrical tape to insulate any wire leads, do so neatly. And I also like to use cable ties in some instances where it's necessary to physically mount the newly installed capacitor to something to keep it from flopping around. And I already assume that you have a soldering iron, solder, hand tools, and that sort of thing. In fact, here's the soldering station I use. It's just a Weller standard grade soldering station. However, I also have a larger iron for soldering terminal strips to the chassis. You're not going to really be able to do an effective job of that with this little Weller soldering station over here. Here's our soldering, desoldering braid that I use to help remove solder. I just place the braid over the connection to be desoldered and then place the hot soldering iron tip on top of the braid and hold it on there. And you'll eventually see the molten solder running up into the braid. And I also like to keep various colors of stranded hookup wire on hand. Not only is that good for replacing rotten wires on a chassis, but in some cases when you're replacing a can electrolytic capacitor like this with individual sections under a chassis, it may be necessary to add an extra length of wire to the original design in order to connect up to your new parts. Here's another device I use. It's called a solder sucker. It's just a spring-loaded vacuum pump. You just cock it like that. And once you heat up the connection with the soldering iron while the solder is still molten, you just put the tip of the sucker on the molten solder and hit the button and it pulls the solder up. This is especially useful on printed circuit boards that have delicate traces because the use of desoldering braid on printed circuit boards can sometimes stress the traces and cause them to lift. So when desoldering, I usually use a combination of the soldering braid and this vacuum pump here. Okay, now I'll dig around in my junk pile and see if we can find some things that I can actually show you some actual case histories as far as capacitor replacement goes. Okay, we'll now look at some examples of some various products where you might see the different types of capacitors that we've already shown you. And we'll start with this old Newcomb classroom record player. This is an earlier model from about 1953. This should have the multi-section metal can style capacitor installed to the chassis. We're not going to do a total repair on this. This is going to be a it's going to need a full overhaul by the way. But we will use this as an example to demonstrate how to change one of those canned multi-section capacitors. And we'll look at some more stuff out here that you'll see in some upcoming videos. We have this MPC classroom record player followed by this Audiotronics record player and then we have a Caliphone record player here and nice little BSR realistic record changer. Let's open this up and get the amp out of it. Here's our amplifier removed from the chassis, and this is the capacitor that we're going to replace. It's a four section capacitor, and our objective at this time is to actually physically leave the capacitor on top of the chassis because I just don't like holes on top of the chassis where something used to be, and we're going to attempt to mount the replacement capacitors under the chassis if room permits. Now first thing you want to do is get all of your required tools together, solder, desoldering braid, solder sucker, needle nose pliers, various other hand tools. Get your soldering station prepared. You want to make sure your sponge is wet for cleaning the tip and you want to make sure to keep the tip tinned with a little bit of solder at all times. Alright, let's look under the chassis and see what we've got. 
Now the first thing you want to do when working on any new repair project is to just eyeball the whole chassis and get a feel for where everything is and what's what. And this is the bottom of the capacitor right here. And as you can see, we have numerous wires connected to it, as well as resistors running from one terminal to the next. I think I mentioned earlier that, that you're most likely going to find this type of arrangement when replacing CAN capacitors. Now the first thing we need to do is uh, determine what values of replacement capacitors we need. And that information is printed on the CAN of the capacitor as well as the corresponding symbol to let you know which terminal is what. It's kind of hard to see this. I'm able to kind of see it through the magnification of the camera. We have a 20 microfarad, 475 volts, and that corresponds to symbol, well, let me find it. Looks like that corresponds to the half round symbol. And then we have a, looks like 10 microfarad at 475 volts, it corresponds to the square. We have a 10 microfarad 475 volt that corresponds to the okay that corresponds to the triangle and then lastly we have a looks like a 25 microfarad 50 volt that has no designation okay 20 10 10 and 25 microfarad and Okay, first three are 475 volts, and then the next one is 50 volts. I'm just, bear with me a minute, I'm just trying to make sure I'm seeing all of this correctly. We've now selected our replacement caps. 22 microfarad, 450 volt for the 20 microfarad, and then 210 microfarad, 450 volts for the 210 microfarad and a 22 microfarad 50 volt for the 25 microfarad. And you're probably saying, well you're breaking your rule. You said earlier not to use a capa replacement capacitor with a lower working voltage rating than the original. Uh, Newcomb was known for over engineering their stuff and using higher voltage rating parts than what was really needed. And I don't have any 475 volt caps on hand. So I looked at our schematic diagram here that they're nice enough to provide in the highest voltage coming off of the rectifier tube once everything warms up is 335 volts. So 450 volts should still be within plenty enough tolerance to handle it. Now I'll just say if you're not familiar with the circuit you're working on you need to stick with the original value that's in the circuit. If you're familiar with electronics and know for definite that say your slightly lower voltage rating capacitor will have plenty enough uh, tolerance to handle the circuit then it's perfectly okay to go that route. Now that we know what symbol corresponds to what, let's look at the bottom of the capacitor. And you remember the other capacitor I showed you had the symbols actually cut through the phenolic. Well this one just has it etched into the base of the capacitor. This particular terminal has a triangle etched next to it. So that corresponds to the 10 microfarad. This particular terminal here has a square etched in it. So that corresponds to the 10 microfarad. This particular terminal has a half circle etched next to it, and that corresponds to the 20 microfarad 450 volt. And this terminal here has no etching, so that's our 25 microfarad 50 volt. That's our cathode bypass capacitor for the audio output tube. Now that we know where everything goes, we can start taking stuff loose. And as you do that, if you're unfamiliar with what you're doing, you'll want to make drawings and notes as to where everything goes. And if you have a schematic diagram like we do here, that will still help you, but I still advise you to make a 
some notes and drawings that you can understand. Okay, here are my crude notes that I would make if I was a newbie doing this. Coming off of our, we have one lead coming off of our 6X5 rectifier tube going to cap section number one, which is the 20 microfarad section denoted by a half circle. Also connected to that section is a 220 ohm resistor. And I noted the colors of the resistor here. That comes over to section number two, which is a 10 microfarad denoted by the square. Also coming off of that capacitor is the B plus input wire to the audio output transformer. Also connected to this capacitor section is a 12K ohm resistor, brown, red, orange. And then the other end of that resistor connects to the final 10 microfarad capacitor. And then also on that capacitor, it goes over to pin 4, which is the screen grid of the 6V6 output tube. Now the fourth section of that capacitor that's actually unmarked with a symbol is a 25 microfarad 50 volt cathode bypass capacitor for the 6V6 output tube. And that particular capacitor is so small that we can just delete the lead on the old CAN capacitor and connect our replacement capacitor for that section directly across this resistor. As you can see, here's the, the only lead connected to this particular section of that capacitor and it goes back over here to this resistor. I can just unsolder this lead, take it completely out of circuit, and our new low voltage cathode bypass capacitor is so small that I can solder it directly across here. Okay, here's the lead desoldered from the capacitor. You can see where it goes over to the cathode resistor. So we'll unsolder the lead from this tube socket pin here. We'll connect our positive end of the 22 microfarad 50 volt to this end of the resistor. And this other end of the resistor will go to chassis ground right here. So we'll just connect the negative end of the capacitor here. But before we do that, we'll measure this resistor with our own meter and make sure it's still in tolerance. Because if it's not, we might as well go ahead and replace it. And these resistors have a tendency to be out of tolerance, so we want to make sure it's good. And the resistor was fine, so there's the new capacitor soldered into place. Have our negative end of the capacitor, the banded end going to chassis ground, the positive end going to the cathode of the tube. And when soldering, you want to make a good mechanical bond to your connection. You want to make sure your iron is hot, tips clean, and you always heat the work, not the solder. And then you apply just enough solder to enough solder to uh, hold the connection together, and then let the connection cool. You don't want to disturb the joint before the solder has time to cool, because that will result in a cold solder joint. And then once everything's cool, you just cut off the excess leads, and then you've got a connection that'll be there for another 60 or 70 plus years. And now we'll go ahead and remove these other components and wires. Okay, we have everything disconnected from the capacitor, and there are the two resistors that were connected between sections there. And I just disconnected everything by unsoldering is everything from the terminals using the desoldering braid and the blue solder sucker and then I would heat up each connection with the soldering iron uh, grabbing each wire or component lead with the needle nose pliers and gently working it loose fortunately I didn't break anything sometimes you will break stuff in the process of, of removing wires and components from capacitors, but if you do, it's usually not the end of the world. Components can be replaced and wires can either be re-stripped or replaced. Now, I need to determine where I'm going to mount the, the new capacitors. And unfortunately, I can't give you a one-size-fits-all answer here because, like I said previously, chassis are all different. So you're just going to have to use some thoughtful planning on your part as to where the best place to mount them would be.
and I think this is where we're going to stick them right here. We're going to mount the terminal strip here and in order to do that you need to take a little piece of sandpaper and sand the area of the chassis where the terminal strip will be soldered because you want everything to be nice and clean. The solder won't stick if it's not clean. And we're going to get our bigger soldering iron. The little pencil soldering station is not going to do too well for this application. And if we can, we'll clamp the physically clamp the terminal strip to the chassis and then solder it in place. Now since they're using the actual chassis as circuit ground, we can use this pin right here to ground our capacitors. However, in some instances the chassis is not circuit ground. The actual capacitor can will be mounted to a phenolic mounting plate which insulates it from the chassis. In such a case you cannot use the actual chassis as circuit ground. You'll have to ground the your capacitors to the actual ground where the original capacitor is connected. Okay, here's our terminal strip in place. It took me several minutes to get the connection to stick because I can't locate my desoldering gun. Remember I did a little rearranging out here and I'm still unpacking stuff so I use this 40 watt big pencil iron here. It still took me several minutes to get everything hot enough so it would stick. The main thing is you want to get everything good and hot and make sure you use enough solder to do the job. And once you get through, you don't disturb the bond until it's that time to cool and then it should be nice and shiny when it's done. See, that ain't, that's not going anywhere. It's going to stay now. Now all we have to do is connect our various connections back up. You remember what I said earlier about you might need to hook up wire because the original wire might not be long enough. Well, I'm, I'm attempting to connect the lead from the rectifier tube here to where the first capacitor section is going to go. And I could make this work, but I really want a better connection than this, so we're going to remove this piece of bare wire and strip a slightly longer piece of standard hookup wire and run it from this point to this point. Here's our piece of hookup wire. We just simply cut it to the right length, stripped it as needed, twisted the strands together and tinned it, which is simply just applying some solder to the leads. Okay, looking at our notes, we have the wire coming from the rectifier tube to the first capacitor, which is a 20 microfarad and also one end of the 220 ohm resistor connects to that point. And there's our replacement lead off of the rectifier tube since the original lead wasn't quite long enough to reach the terminal. So we'll put our first capacitor between here, positive terminal here. This will be our ground and our 220 ohm resistor will go between here and here. Okay, here's capacitor number one in place. Here's our lead coming from the rectifier to one end of the 220 ohm resistor. Positive terminal of the capacitor there. Our negative terminal banded in of the capacitor connected to our ground lug here. Now we'll connect a, the other resistor which I believe was a 12,000 ohm. Yeah, 12,000 ohm. It will be connected according to our notes. We'll connect our second capacitor, which will be 10 microfarad, to the other end of the 220 ohm resistor in ground. And then we'll connect our 12K resistor to that point too. Okay, so cap number two is in place just to check our steps. Wire coming from rectifier tube to our first terminal. That's that's a go. 20 microfarad cap from first terminal to ground. That's a go. One end of 220 ohm resistor to first terminal. That's a go. Other end of the 220 ohm resistor to the second terminal. That's good.
and then the positive end of our 10 microfarad cap to the second terminal right there that's good uh, one end of the 12 K ohm resistor to that terminal that's good you can see the resistor hiding back there and then lastly to that terminal we have the wire going to the output transformer and that's also where it's supposed to be now we have one more capacitor to install first let's look at the 12 K ohm resistor and you can see it goes down to right here where there's also a lead going to the screen grid of the 6V6 audio output tube. We have those two items physically connected. So now all we have to do is connect the final 10 microfarad capacitor, positive end here, ground here, and that will conclude the electrolytic capacitor replacement. Okay, and that takes care of the installation of the electrolytic capacitors in this amplifier. Now at a later date we'll do a proper, well we'll continue the restoration attempt or effort on this amplifier by checking all of the other resistors, replacing these two red capacitors, testing tubes, etc. Needs a new power cord. In fact here is part of the old power cord. You can see the insulation is kind of crusty on there and some of it's done flaked off. But going to replace that with a three wire power cord but the main thing is just make sure everything is secure that your solder connections are nice and shiny and that all leads that have a possibility of touching something are insulated where they can't short out to anything and you can see I've used heat shrink tubing for that purpose and there we are back with the cover in place now Next on the agenda, I'm going to try to locate a locate a radio or record player with a printed circuit board mounted multi-section capacitor, and I'll demonstrate the best way to to replace that. Okay, here's a here's an example of a radio that used a multi-section capacitor on a printed circuit board. In fact, this is the old two-section capacitor that came out of it that I replaced with two individual capacitors when first of all, I'll give you some desoldering tips on a printed circuit board you really want to use something like this, this suction device for removing as much solder as possible and then you can use the desoldering braid to clean up any excess but you really don't want to use much of the braid because that just adds extra heat to the already delicate traces on the printed circuit board and those traces can lift up very easily. If you make a mistake and accidentally lift a trace or a trace breaks you can always bypass it with a piece of hookup wire. Just solder one end from point A to point B. Now, I'm not going to remove the new parts but I'll show you how this was oriented. It was oriented in the board like this and if you feel the need to make a mark on the capacitor so you'll know which way it was oriented in the board you can do so that way you can keep track of the terminals. So let's say we've unsoldered everything and we pull out the part and we look at our color code or our number code I should say. C is 80 microfarad 150 volts, B is 40 microfarad 150 volts, and A is common. So A would be down here, under here. C would be this capacitor here, which cross-references to a, indicates an 80 microfarad, and B would be the 40 microfarad right here. So you just insert the, tie the negative terminals of the two capacitors together, insert them through the printed circuit board, bend the leads back over, carefully solder the leads in place, and then use your cutters to cut off the excess leads. And that's how you change a printed circuit board mounted cap. And like I mentioned earlier, in some cases you'll find a can capacitor 
with four lugs on it just like what we saw on the Newcomb record player and you sometimes need to run a wire around where those four ground lugs went to complete the ground connection that was originally made up by the by the original capacitor can now let's talk about the type of capacitor that has wires coming out of it this is a familiar scheme red red wire 50 microfarad positive yellow wire 30 microfarad positive and the black wire is common negative so how do we get around that well like I showed you earlier in the video normally what I do is just cut the the wires right up where they enter into the capacitor body and then strip the wires back and then I'll slide a suitably sized piece of heat shrink tubing over each wire and then I'll select the replacement parts 47 microfarad 200 volt for the 50 microfarad 150 volt and then a 33 microfarad for the 30 micro for the 30 microfarad and then I tie my two negatives together heat shrinking that particular lead to keep it from possibly touching something wrap it around there like that and then I'll solder it and then I slide heat shrink tubing down over the three leads there and shrink it down to size and I trim the leads down to size and bend them into a J-hook configuration now I know this is not a red wire but pretend like it's the red wire coming out of the chassis that corresponds to the 47 microfarad section and what I'll do now is I'll slide an even bigger piece of heat shrink tubing over this lead as you can see there and then we will clean with a piece of sandpaper if necessary clean the old wire and then tin it with some solder to make it easier to solder it to our capacitor and then we'll bend this wire back into a J-hook like that and then we'll crimp the wires together to give them a good solid mechanical bond and then we'll solder them and there they are crimped nice mechanical connection and now it's soldered. So now that it's soldered, we just take our larger piece of heat shrink tubing like this, slide it over the uh, connection, and then heat it up, and then it'll be good to go. And then we'll repeat the same process for the other remaining leads here. And there you go. Now there's no way that wire can short out to anything now. And like I said, you'll do the same thing for the other two. You'll put the black wire here on your negative heat shrink it up real good and then your yellow wire on your 33 microfarad section here and then shrink it up real good and for mounting you can you can zip tie this to the original clamp that the old electrolytic was attached to or you can put a blop of silicon on it silicone it in place just whatever you wish to do just make sure it's physically secure and can't move around all right this should about conclude the tutorial on how to replace various types of electrolytic multi-section capacitors and vintage equipment if there's anything I failed to cover you can ask me a question or whatever I'll be glad to help if I can and with that said, thanks for watching this extremely long video. I hope you got something out of it, and we'll get back into fixing some stuff very soon.